Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today evening. And I have known that when devotees introduce, they tend to lovingly exaggerate. Uh, but I think Radha Damodar Prabhu's love exceeds the reality by infinite times. So don't take his introduction very seriously. I hope that after that introduction, the class won't be a disappointment for you. <laughs> so I'll speak on this topic of strung by the tongue. It is based on 17.15 in the Bhagavad Gita, which talks about austerity of speech. Anudveg karam vakyam satyam priyahitam chayat swadhyaya bhyasanam chayiva vanmayam tapa uchyate. So Krishna says, Anudveg karam vakyam. Speak in a way that does not do udvega towards others, does not cause agitation to others. Satyam, speak truthfully. Priya, speak that is in a way that is pleasing to others. Hitam, speak that which is beneficial to others. Swadhyay abhyasanam chaiva, speak that which is according to scripture. Van mayam tapa uchyate, van mayam tapa, that this is austerity of speech. It's interesting, one maya, one is speech, maya is full of. So this is that which is full of austerity that is filled with or centered on speech. Tapa uchyate it is called. Normally we think of austerity in terms of say fasting. We may do some ekadashi is there, janmashtami is there. At that time austerity means we feel like eating but we decide I will not eat. So similarly austerity of speaking means that we feel like doing something but we regulate that according to discipline and what are the broad guidelines for the discipline Krishna is telling us in this so the topic which I mentioned strung by the tongue what it means is that our tongue is a rope and sometimes if a person is in the past a person would be hung then <coughs> they would be hung by a rope so they could be strung up by a rope and hung by a rope. So to be strung by a rope means to be existing in a state of suspension, helpless. And to be hung means to be killed. So strung by a the tongue means our tongue can become like a rope which, which causes us, which keeps us in a state of suspension, which causes us misery, which can cause even destruction. The power of speech is often one of the most underestimated powers in society. Now, obviously, if somebody is fluent, we notice that. Somebody is very good at public speaking, we notice that. And we all may have a desire. I want, a good, I, want, I want to be a good speaker. And there are many public speaking courses which people may do. So in that sense, we do recognize that speech is a power. And if somebody can be a great speaker, hundreds and thousands of people come to their talks, then naturally that, oh, recognize, that we recognize that power. But today I am not going to talk in that sense of speech that can mesmerize and captivate hundreds of thousands of people. I am going to talk of speech as it affects us in our day to day relationships that this is where the speech has power to to even break hearts speech has great power in relationships to wound or heal relationships and i have been spending a good amount of time in america so america there is a great fear of people with guns crushing into crowded places, into schools, into uh, uh, theatres and just going mad on a rampage and shooting. In fact, several of my friends are told that even I was at a university lecture and suddenly then alarm went off and then everybody, somebody screamed and everybody ducked under the desk, to duck under the desk and they told me duck under the desk 
So what happened? The gunmen in the campus. And then everybody knocked on their decks and then some security officer came in. And he opened the door, he looked in and he walked away. And then after some time he came back and he said, you know, this was just a, a test. Does everyone actually duck under not? <laughs> so there's no gun movement over there. But the point is there's a lot of concern among people uh, that when people have not just guns which can be used for self-defense, but they're almost like machine guns, automatic guns which can kill hundreds of people. They mm -hmm. are available indiscriminately uh, without much licensing or regulation, without considering the mental health of people. Now, America also has history. The rest of the world can't understand. Why can't Americans regulate guns? No other, con no other country has as many deaths because of gun violence internally in the country. Many countries allow citizens to possess firearms, but America it's very loose and just regulated. But there's a very powerful gun lobby that <coughs> avoids it, that fights against it. And there is an emotional mm, history behind it. When America was a colony like India under the British Empire, at that time one of the decisive battles was the Battle of Luxembourg. And Luxembourg was the place where the British had stored their gunpowder. And the rebels, the American revolutionaries, they were launch, uh, marching to Luxembourg and the British were also marching to Luxembourg. So whoever would get to the guns first, you have guns but you need gunpowder, it's no use. So basically, whoever could arm their guns first, they would emerge victorious. And in that time, the citizens of Luxembourg and nearby nearby counties, they formed a human wall and they blocked the British army from reaching. And then the revolutionaries reached over there and that was a decisive turning point. Because otherwise the uh, revolutionaries were not large in number, they were scattered, they were not trained warriors. The, but the British army was much more organized, but somehow they won. So because that position of gun power tilted the scale for Americans in the war of independence. So America has that emotional attachment to the right to possess guns. So one of the sayings is that if we outlaw guns, then only outlaws will have guns. <laughs> and I say, hey, if a thief comes to your house and he's got a gun, what will you do if you don't have a gun? Now, it's true, but now what happens is that, okay, there will be a thief who may come and shoot us, but there is a wild person inside us also. That person may come and shoot for no reason, pick up a gun and shoot for no reason. So why I'm talking about this is that although the power of a gun can be disastrous, but, oh, and we may not have guns in our country, but all of us have something that can be equally dangerous. And that is the power of speech. Words uh, don't go out like bullets. They don't physically lodge into the body and create holes in the body, physically. But words can cause as much damage. The words can break hearts. Words can shatter relationships. Words can cause, cause families to fall apart. Words can cause friends to become enemies. And that's why it's important for us to learn to regulate the power of words. Now, if we had a gun, we would be extremely careful about how we use it. Even if we had impulses, we would make sure that if the, I'll not keep the gun where it's easily accessible. Otherwise, you, know, you might just get angry at someone and pick up a gun and shoot them. Why, what did I do? Many times these gunmen, after they shoot, some gunmen are very organized and they go and kill people in mass in a very planned way cold blood to be, but some gunmen just get angry, they shoot someone and then they, what do I do? And then not knowing how to face themselves after what they have done, just turn the gun and shoot themselves. So it, just as if we had a gun, we would be extremely careful about how we would use it. So similarly, our own tongue, it can cause enormous damage. Now of course there is a big difference between a tongue and a gun. A gun, as I said, it shoots, it injures, it kills. A gun itself can't heal. But the power of speech is such that it can be 
it can heal also it can encourage so the tongue is such a power by which we can we can have positive results in the outer world we can have negative results in the outer world and many times whenever there are any relationships and there are relationship issues there can be many different issues and sometimes we may say actions speak louder than words but that's not always true in relationships you know if if somebody has spoken harsh words and then after that even we do 10 good actions but still those words may be remembered more than the actions different people are different some people are ultra sensitive about words and even if they want to that word gets lodged into their memory and they just can't forget it now how dare you say like this to me how could you even think like this about me and that's why it becomes almost like a indelible mark on the memory and that mark on the memory is not just a informational mark it's a emotional wound and then whenever we associate with that person we might remember oh you spoke like that to me you spoke like that to me you spoke like that to me and in some ways we may envy somebody who can speak very fluently and if we can't speak so fluently we feel oh you know i don't have such fluent speech but actually if if we have fluent fluency or speech and we don't have control over speech it can be a deadly combination because we can fluently speak terrible words <laughs> and at least if we are not that fluent then we are angry also like some people when they become i'm angry they are so angry that they just can't speak anything they become incoherent but some people they become angry and all the resentment negativity anger that is there it comes out in such hurtful fluent words that it like you are sitting like we are sitting near a um, we are sitting in our house and suddenly a dam breaks and the dam floods our house we are sitting at one place and suddenly you knocked out and is propelled away in the flood so like that at one moment we are sitting peacefully and suddenly this person uh, launches a tirade against us what happened and many times you know we speak and then afterwards hey i didn't mean to say that we call it a slip of the tongue how many of us have this experience slip of the tongue a <laughs> slip of the tongue yes now we all have this experience and the more public the occasion the more people who are hearing the more embarrassing it can be now we say it's interesting word you this slip of the tongue what do we mean by slip of the tongue say like if you're walking and we slip then we stumble we may fall down but basically we become imbalanced so like that when we are speaking and there's a slip of the tongue that means we are speaking in one way but suddenly something else comes out now some most people speak to express their thoughts but some people speak to discover their thoughts <laughs> <laughs> they speak first and they think later hey i didn't mean to say that <laughs> so that when they sub surprise the people speak something and then after they speak that the other person is surprised by what this person spoke but they are themselves that surprised how did i speak this <laughs> so what happens sometimes the tongue seems to be working on its own as if you know the tongue is uh, disconnected from the brain and the tongue seems to be like on a autopilot mode <laughs> <laughs> when the tongue goes like this on autopilot mode sometimes we don't even understand what we are speaking and we can cause a lot of damage so when krishna is telling here vanmayam tapa uchyate that regulate the power of speaking actually one broad aspect of regulating is we all learn how to speak and nowadays most people are trying for literacy they can even write but every human being learns language we all learn to speak but one aspect of learning to speak is learning when not to speak learning when not to speak and that is not a skill which many people learn there are times when a 
a strategic silence is the best policy. And yes, yes, I can speak, but whatever I speak, it will get me into trouble. So sometimes some people put us in, in trick situations also. There are trick questions which people ask. So one common example of a trick question is you ask a man, have you stopped beating your wife? <laughs> there is no right answer to this. <laughs> if you say no, that means you are still beating your wife. <laughs> what a shameless person. And you say yes, that means you admitted you are beating your wife before. <laughs> <laughs> so, whichever answer you give, <laughs> it's a trap. So, actually some questions, it's best not to answer them or we have to, we cannot answer in the terms that the question is framed. You change the terms. Who told you that I beat my wife? Isn't it? So, you presented a pseudo set of options and then if we, we are an autopilot, then we just walk within those options and that can get us into trouble. So, basically, I'm going to talk about in th these three parts. First part I talked about is how dangerous speech can be. And then one, that's why one aspect of learning uh, to speak is learning when not to speak. Hmm? In the Mahabharat, before the Kurukshetra war, the Duryodhan is so arrogant that and so confident, so foolishly confident, I am going to win the war. He feels as if the war is not going to be a match also. Now, I have got 11 Akshahunis, and I have got Bhishma and Drona and Karana. These Pandavas, it will not be a match also. It's like say, if, uh, if say India is very good in cricket and some team like Holland, they're, they're having a match. They say, these are minnows, they can't even, mm, they will be no match to us. So he thought it will be like that. And so, before the Kurukshetra war, the previous night, he sent Uluka. Uluka rather. Uluka was the son of Shakuni. And he sent him with a message. And the whole message he told Uluka, Ulanga, Uluka had this capacity to remember what was spoken. He says, you remember this and you repeat it. And the whole message was all meant to provoke the Pandavas. Is Bhima, you think you are very powerful, but I reduced you to the position of a woman cooking in the kitchen. This happened when he was in the Agnyatwas, in the incognito exile. He says, oh, Arjun, you think you are a great warrior? I reduced you to eunuch. And like that, he insults every one of them. Now, when Uluka goes over there, he is super hmm. scared. Suppose we have to give some message, <laughs> you have to repeat some words and there they are words that are going to make that person very angry. So first thing we will say, these are not my words, eh? don't get angry with me, <laughs> these are not my words. So Lucas says, oh Yudhishthir, please remember the codes of war that if a messenger gives any message, the messenger should never be punished. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> so Yudhishthir said, don't worry, whatever is the message tell. But then when he starts telling, and the whole Kaurava camp is in a Pandava camp is in uproar. And he taunts everyone. And his idea is that when they are taunted like this, then we will have some kind of fight. And all the Kapandavas get so angry and they pick up their weapons and they are just blazing with anger. And Arjuna tells Huluka, he says that Duryodhan tell him that you have spoken your words but tomorrow my arrows will speak to you and eventually by that action he just shows that he has no interest in any kind of reconciliation if fire is burning a wise person will try to extinguish the fire but what Duryodhan did was he put more fuel in the fire more fuel in the fire and Duryodhan is a classic example of how not to use the power of speech. Hey, there was a car of, he had already done terribly wrong things against the Pandavas. But on top of that, he had also done terribly wrong thing to Krishna by trying to arrest Krishna. Mm -hmm. And that is like say if there is a conflict between India and Pakistan, 
normally say the Indian Defense Secretary and the Pakistan Defense Secretary might meet if you want to have some peace. But suppose the Indian Prime Minister goes as the peace envoy, as to seek peace, that means there is very serious intent for seeking peace. And suppose the Indian Prime Minister goes to Islamabad and <coughs> Pakistan tries to arrest the Indian Prime Minister over there. It will consider to be a national outrage and war will break out over there. So that's what Duryodhana had already done when he had tried to arrest Krishna. But on top of that, what did he do? He now provoked the Pandavas further. And by that, the, by the, already the war had become inevitable. But at least the bitter feeling, feelings in the war could have been minimized. But by evoking all the bitter feelings, he just made things completely irreconcilable. Now, why would he do something like this? As I said, he felt that this is not going to be a match at all. At least we'll have some fun, we'll have some fight. But he grossly overestimated his power. And as one by one by one by one, all the generals fell, he had to bite his words. He had to, he had to be crushed, humiliated and destroyed. Panda's intention was not to, be humi to humiliate him, but that's what his arrogance led to. So now when I'm talking here about, I first talked about how uncontrolled, in an uncontrolled way, in a in an unthinking way, we might speak harshly. But this example I am giving, how intentionally we might speak harshly. Sometimes we are, we are so angry with someone, like if somebody has spoken something to us, then we actually mentally planning. Next time when I see this person, I'll speak this and I'll speak this and I'll speak this. I'll speak this. I'll speak this. Sometimes somebody speaks uh, speaks some kind of put down to us, speaks something minimizing, something insulting, and then we don't have the presence of mind to speak something back. Then the mind goes on a revenge fantasy. And next time when I see this person, I'll speak this. I'll speak this. I'll speak this. I'll speak this. So there, it's more. It's not. So there can be some destructive speech which is hot blooded. And there can be some destructive speech that is cold-blooded. Hot-blooded means just in the rush of, rush of the moment, we speak wrongly. But cold-blooded destructive speech is even more dangerous. Where somebody has planned and spoken. Now sometimes it might be useful. Say sarcasm is where somebody speaks in a way that is biting in a, to convey some point. Now, sarcasm in say in cartoons or stand up comedies or something like that is good but sarcasm in close relationships is not at all good it can be very alienating so there are times when we laugh with people and there are times when we laugh at people so laugh with people means as yes, it's all a joke and we are laughing together so maybe there's some politician over there and we all laugh with them. So, okay, that might be okay, but when we laugh at people, that means we make somebody who is near us, physically and emotionally, we make them the target of our sarcasm. And that, that is very painful. Because those words are like, not just arrows, but we could say they are poison tinged arrows. The arrow itself pierces and hurts, but imagine if in front of the arrow there is poison. The poison permeates into the body, that hurts even more. So, uh, how do we deal with this tendency? You all have this urge to speak and when anger comes up, when, when we feel certain, an overwhelming urge to speak. So, we could say Duryodhana is an example of somebody who was eventually strung by the tongue. You know, he, he fell down and he was humiliated and he was defeated, destroyed. Sita in the Ramayana is an example of somebody who spoke harshly but unintentionally. We see that when Ram was chasing Maricha and at that time <coughs> Maricha uh, imitated Ram's voice and called out, Hey Lakshman, Hey Sita. And then Sita became frantic with worry. She told Ram, please. She told Lakshman, 
please go and help Ram. So Lakshman said, Ram cannot be in any danger. No demon can put Ram in danger. Because Sita was so frantic with worry, she somehow wanted to push Ram, push Lakshman to go. Said, now I understand why you are not going. Says, all along you are planning that you had an evil eye on me. You are just waiting for an opportunity. Now if Ram is out of the way, then you will have your way with me. He says, I shriek. He said, I will die, but I will not be touched by you. And now Lakshman was aghast to hear even such an accusation. And he folded his hands. He says, oh, Sita, you don't know what you are speaking. But still, the words you are speaking are so unbearable that I cannot tolerate them anymore. I am going to leave. I know because if I leave, I, I know when I leave, disaster will befall you. But still, I cannot stay over here. And he departed from there. And then, we know Ravan sneaked in over there and he abducted Sita. But the point here is that eventually, when Ra Ram, Lakshman, Sita were all reunited, Lakshman never held it against Sita. He never reminded her at that time, you know, you spoke like this to me. There are certain things you have spoken in tension. Now here I am going to the third point, that the th first point was how we may speak unintentionally, something harsh, sometimes we may speak in a cold blooded calculated way. Third is now if before we can deal with that, with our case, we can deal with it when we are at the receiving end. So Lakshman was at the receiving end of such harsh speech, but what did he do? He, he was hurt at that time, but he did not hold it against Sita. So what is spoken? Intention. There is no need to see intention in that. Don't see intention, intention. So sometimes, just in the rush of the moment, people may speak certain things. They will hurt, but we don't have to hold it against them. We can't say that I will not feel hurt by it. But, okay. We feel hurt, but afterwards, if see, there is a choice for us when certain words get imprinted in our consciousness. They are there, but we can choose how much we replay them. Just like sometimes some files are there in the computer, we can't delete them. Maybe they are in an area where we don't have the access to delete it. The file is there, but we can choose whether we open it or not. If you choose not to open, the file will be there, but it won't damage us so much. So like that, those, that memory might still be there within us. This person spoke like this to me. But to hold that, that those words against that person means we speak it again and again and again. Or we remember it and we remind that person, you spoke like this. But he didn't do that. <laughs> it's the, under the force of emotion, under the force of situation, people may speak all kinds of things. Even we may speak various kinds of things. We don't have to take that very seriously. So, first of all, you, if why am I talking about this point? That unless we give others, you can come ahead, please. Unless we give others the benefit of doubt, no, we will not get. St unless we forgive others their harsh words, we will not get the strength to forget the harsh words that have been spoken to us. Ultimately, the universe is reciprocal. There is a law of karma. Now, if we, we remember that this person hurt me like this, then if we hold people's mis abuse of their power of speech against us, then that same power of speech will come back and hurt us also. So having said that, if we move forward, now, again in the Ramayana we see that how speech can bring down barriers. And the best example for this, can you guess who is the best example? How speech can bring down barriers. Okay. One more person. Hanuman. Yes, Hanuman himself. Thank you. In which occasions? When Sita Mata was in forest, uh, abducted by Yes. Yes, correct. Thank you. In fact, it's both occasions when Ram f when Hanuman first met Ram and Hanuman met Sita, both of them. So let's look at both those incidents. When Hanuman met Ram for the first time, at that time 
it was a situation of suspicion sugreev so, was living in fear living in fear that maybe wali will send someone to kill me he was living in the area of kishkind in near the pampa sarovar where wali because of a curse could not enter but wali might send someone to kill him and then when he saw ram and lakshman he was taken aback he was alarmed because these were these were people wearing the ascetic dress but they were carrying bows and arrows so who are these this is this is suspicious it's like it's as incompatible as somebody you see somebody wearing a sadhu dress and carrying a machine gun hey what is going on <laughs> so he was taken aback and then he got alarmed and then uh, jambo knows the thing jambo said don't get alarmed let's find out who is this and they asked ram to uh, they asked hanuman to go and hanuman changed his garb and he took the garb of a brahmana and as a brahmana he came over there and started speaking very sweetly <coughs> and he as you speaking so sweetly ram turned toward lakshman he said this speech is so sweet that just by hearing a speech i am feeling so peaceful my mind is pacified my mind yeah. is feeling cheerful <coughs> so actually this is the power of speech that some people can speak just so sweetly so soothingly so gently that the agitated mind the agitated mind becomes calm now ram was agitated ram in one sense is transcendental but he is also a relational person and as a relational god he has emotions so in separation from sita he was agitated but just by hearing hanuman's brahmanical words he felt a calming sensation and thus because hanuman was ram was searching for sita he was in anxiety so that anxiety could have also caused a barrier so hanuman by sweet speech he lowered the guard of course there was not much danger because ram, ram is very powerful but still for communication to happen you know, trust has to be one and in general if we look at each other how do we we all make some assessment of people when we meet them broadly speaking we assess people in four ways one is how they look you can say okay this person is wearing very okay this kind of dress i think they may be from this part of the country or maybe they belong to this financial bracket or you know they may be from this culture or whatever how they look then second is how they speak if somebody is using all kind of foul words in their speaking then okay this person may be from a particular kind of strata in society oh this person looks very well educated very fluent then we look at not just how they speak we look at what they speak so if we see somebody talking about about some something scientific or something philosophical you see this person seems to be an intelligent person uh, people may talk about sports or movies or politics what are they talking about and then we may ask them what do you do what are they doing right now and what do they do as a profession so by that we broadly try to begin a first impression of people Now in this you will see <coughs> their appearance the manner of speech the content of speech and the action here if you see speech plays a very important role it said that sometimes we don't know about a subject and sometimes uh, if we still try to speak something about a subject now some people if we stay silent if this person doesn't know anything they may doubt like that so our silence may create the doubt that maybe this person is ignorant but our speech may remove that doubt and create certainty that we are ignorant <laughs> 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 so it may well be better to stay silent in some situations so the manner of speaking and the content of speaking both are important and kalyuga many people look more at the manner of speaking than the content of speaking in fact uh, in kalyuga one of the characters of kalyuga is a satyatve dharshtyam evahi the more audaciously someone speaks the more truthful they are considered to be hmm? so bhakti sanskrit akur tells the story that 
Has once, has, once has a, there's a person who was considered by his own small tribe to be a very scholarly person, and he challenged a great scholar to a debate. And the scholar came, and the scholar spoke elaborately in, Sans elaborately in Sanskrit. And this person who knew very little Sanskrit, who had no learning, yes, this kastam, kastam, mastam, kastam. That verb is this is custom, custom, mustam, mustam. Now this scholar is so stunned. He says he doesn't even understand basic language, and he is trying to debate over here. He is so amazed by this that he stayed silent for a few moments. And that person's followers just see we have made him silent. We have won the match. <laughs> <laughs> So sometimes some people their knowledge is amazing and some people their ignorance is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> now if you see um, there is a brand of entertainment that has become popular over the last 10-15 years and that is reality TV. <laughs> now if you see in reality TV actually those who are stars their only qualification is an extraordinary capacity to be shameless. <laughs> <laughs> you speak outrageously. And the more outrageous things you speak, the more outrageous things you do, the more, wow, you can do that also. <laughs> they, they may have no talent at all. So people get so influenced by it. In fact, it is not just a matter of entertainment. You know, the American president is a reality TV star. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Who eventually has become the most powerful person in the world now. <clears throat> and of course, now this urge to speak, it has been extended to social media. The one person can speak and that speech can go so far and out. Across the world it can go. <coughs> so here I am talking about this point that speech can lower barriers as it did for Hanuman. And similarly speech can lower barrier, it lowered barriers with Sita. Now Sita was actually in, a, uh, in uh, Sita was with respect to Hanuman, she was even a, in, a, in an even more vulnerable position. Ram at least had his weapons. Sita was imprisoned by Ravan and <coughs> she also knew that Ravan would try to impersonate or trick her into submitting to him. So that's why when Hanuman came in a monkey form, he first came in a small monkey form. And he started speaking the glories of Ram. When Sita heard it, she was attracted. But after that, still she was, who is this? Maybe somebody is tricking me. But then I started speaking, I started speaking special pastimes which nobody knew except Ram and Sita. And those Ram had told only to Hanuman. And then by that, by that sweet glorification of the Lord, Sita understood that this is really a representative of Ram. And then they had a very stirring conversation. So you have the greatest devotee of Ram and the greatest servant of Ram. They meet together. And in this, in this, this is in the Sundar Kand of the Ramayana. There actually the Sundar Kand, the Sundar has many different meanings. One of the name, one of the names of Hanuman is a child of Sundar. Another meaning is that actually the, the beauty of the Ramayana is the Karuniras. The the feeling of devotional agony, the, the angst of devotion. So that is experience. Although Ram is not present in the in the Sundar Kand in terms of action, but still Ram is present in terms of the recollection. And Ram's presence at that time is very strongly felt through this interaction. That is that is Sundarya, that is the beauty, that is Sundarta of that Kand. So speech can can break down barriers. Now we do say that actions speak louder than words, but often words are needed to explain actions. So for example, if Prabhupada went to America and he could have just been chanting Hare Krishna, translating his Bhagavatam 
if he had not explained to people what he was doing, we would not have understood at all. So yes, we should be devoted to Krishna. But if we are devoted to Krishna, it's our responsibility to also explain what do you mean by devotion to Krishna? Why are we doing what we are doing? So words, sometimes when we say actions are more, speak louder than words, we may minimize words. But no, actions speak louder than words. But sometimes words are needed to explain what the actions are speaking. Words are needed, otherwise the actions, what they speak, we use a strange old man doing some strange old things. People could have thought like that. So now, uh, <coughs> so if we look at this, sweet speech can bring down barriers. And even in relationships, even if uh, old uh, wounds have been fossilized and they become long standing injuries are there. But if we make a conscious effort to try to speak gently, speak sweetly, then we can bring down barriers. We can actually uh, uh, create, our words can create windows instead of walls. Sometimes we speak such words that every word that we speak becomes like a, like a brick which adds to the wall and that becomes like a China wall. Now of course people don't know China wall, now most people are talking about the Trump wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which he wants to have to check immigration. But whichever. It becomes like a wall which blocks people. So, but words can also become like windows which create means for communication, means for understanding. So what do we do? I'll, I'll conclude with this point of it's a whole big subject but how, how can we avoid words that are hurtful? How can we speak words that are helpful? So first thing is that s start with the objective, not the subjective. That means what? That, you, know, you are such an irresponsible person. Here what has happened? We have already made a judgment. The same person who we consider as irresponsible, somebody else may consider to be very irresponsible. So basically, if, if somebody is doing something which is making us angry and we feel hurt by that, and naturally we feel hurt, we feel angered and they have done something. So there are three things over here. There is a person, there is their action and there is our emotion. So what happens is, we don't talk about the action, we don't even, we don't even talk about our emotion so much. We just give our judgment about how the person is. Suppose somebody one day just comes to us and he says, I have forgiven you. Hmm? Thank you very much. What did I do to need forgiveness? <laughs> <laughs> what did I do to need forgiveness? <laughs> what are you forgiving me about? Oh, now he say, hey, you did such a terrible thing. I had so much difficulty forgiving you. And I have forgiven you and you don't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? What do you mean you forgive me? What did I, what wrong did I do? <laughs> so it can begin with a complete breakdown of communication instead of reconciliation. <laughs> so <laughs> we may think, oh, you know, after great effort, I have decided to forgive you. <laughs> what? <laughs> so what we need to do is, if we want to avoid if we want our communication, our speech to build walls, not walls, windows, then first begin with the objective. Objective means facts. So what is the objective? Now, when you forgot to do this thing. So when we do that way, what happens is, that is an objective fact. People do not deny that, yes, I forgot to do that. When you forgot to do this, I felt terribly hurt because it, this was so important for me or because I needed it at that time, whatever. So what happens that we cannot suppress our, uh, our anger, our hurt, our resentment, our negativity, it is there. But if you could structure it a little more carefully. One characteristic of Rajoguna is to separate the emotion from the situation. Not that we do not feel the emotion, but we learn to separate the emotion from the situation. So what emotion from the situation means, rather than judging the person, you are such a short tempered person, you are such a forgetful person, you are such a lazy person, you are like this, you are like that. Okay, 
that is my emotion but focus first on the situation if we want to if we want to discuss if we want to build windows then even if there is 99% disagreement between us we have to start with the 1% agreement start with 1% agreement now what could be the 1% agreement that is the fact the fact now when you forgot to do this or when you spoke like this or when you did like this so okay i did like that now they may have a very different reason why i did it or what happened but when you start with start with the action as objective as possible see for all of us say if some surgeon is going to cut uh, cut something now if a barber cuts the hair there is not much pain because the hair is not having any sensation but suppose we are shaving and at that time they pull not out the cut not just the hair but some of the roots then what happens we feel more pain now if somebody is doing some surgery and they uh, or somebody is doing some amputation or something like that and they cut the nerve the closer we go to the nerve the greater is the pain so uh, when they do tattoos tattoos tattooing can actually be quite a very painful thing if the tattooing a tattoo artist is not very good then the tattoo, tattoo artist actually if it cuts the nerves or even touches the nerves it's very painful so the closer to a nerve that we go the more the pain is there if you are cutting far away from the nerve like cut the hair above then there is a little pain so similarly the the more directly we attack a person that's like going closer to the nerve the person becomes agitated the person becomes defensive a person becomes aggressive so yes so there is there is a situation there is the, our emotion and there is their they as a person or because there is their, their action there is our emotion about their action and it is they themselves so suppose we wanted something very important and they forgot to get it we may be very upset i may say you are such a irresponsible person so what has happened here we have attacked them as a person and then immediately they respond you think i am irresponsible last time you forgot that so what happens is instead of try to deal with the issue we point out something wrong with them and they point out that you are so irresponsible also so then it just becomes worse at that time so to start first with something which is as objective as possible what is objective the situation or the action now when you forgot to get this then people can't deny the situation the action situation that's true and then if i say i felt so hurt i felt so betrayed i felt so angry i felt so disappointed now again in general in close relationships nobody wants to hurt anyone else intentionally and if somebody comes and tells us no i felt very hurt by what you spoke oh what did i speak i had no intention to hurt you so again when it is our emotion people can't deny that emotion now whether my emotion they can say whether your emotion is right or wrong in the sense that you know, it is it is unwarranted emotion or it's a warranted emotion but when we communicate our hurt then what happens we we folk we invoke not the defensive instinct of the other person but the caring instinct of the other person if somebody tells oh you know i cut my finger then in the close relationship that person will not bring a knife to cut the finger further isn't it that person will immediately bring a bandage okay let me apply it so when in general when the relationship become cold you know we all raise our guards up and if we raise our guards up we hide our emotions we hide our feelings and then just basically hurt people hurt people when people are hurt themselves they hurt others hurt people hurt people and in this case what happens there's no sense of proportion left so for example somebody steps on my foot now as soon as i feel there maybe there's a the heavy set person stepping on my foot and i'll push them away mm-hmm. now if i push them away and they fall down and they knock the knock knock on their they hurt their head and they get injured i say i'm sorry now but at that time i had no intention to injure them 
my intention was simply i don't say about my food so when we are hurt often we respond by doing something that hurts the other person although our intention is not to hurt the other person so similarly what happens is when say if i am hurt uh, if somebody stepped on my foot and we just you are stepping on my foot oh i'm sorry that person will remove their foot immediately so if we push they may get angry why did you push me because they may not even notice that they have stepped on our foot hey, why did you push me like that what a impolite person so begin with the action then speak the emotion and then we can if we want we can speak our perception or our opinion so that you are lazy you are irresponsible you are insensitive these are all judgments and once we start making judgments immediately people become either defensive no i am not like that or they become aggressive you call me like that but how are you then the whole issue becomes complicated so anudveg karam vakyam don't agitate people's minds that means if we consider our words to be like a scissor or a knife don't cut the nerve try to cut as far away from the nerve as possible when we do that try to cut as far away from the nerve as possible what happens by that is that that person doesn't immediately become defensive that person oh okay i don't want to hurt you i'll not do it that way if we work we'll find that. now i may say at that point it's so difficult for me to do it it is true it is difficult but actually not doing it will create far more difficulties so start with the situation and sometimes that's why if we are angry we are hurt maybe some maybe that is not the best time to speak at all so it, so i was at a, as in a community uh, where the devotees that there are there is a four or five devotees are equal in spirituality and the moral equal they have introduced about 15 20 years ago in krishna consciousness and they they work together in the same project and actually misunderstandings happen conflicts come up so they have a forum where every 15 days they meet and say they if they meet for 2 hours the first one hour they just simply discuss krishna katha that means maybe one hour or half an hour 45 minutes what they do at that time is each of them speaks something inspiring that they are hearing that they have heard something that touched them something that inspired them so then what happens just by hearing somebody speak something inspiring philosophically we start seeing them spiritually otherwise we start seeing people very operationally operationally means you know okay this person is doing this but this person is like this this person is like this so when we have that conscious krishna centered discussion then by that we develop a spiritual vision and it's not like one person gives lecture but everybody shares oh then we start seeing each others we are all fellow seekers on the same spiritual journey and then after that when they have created that atmosphere of satwa of of bhakti of spiritual appreciation for each other then if they have any grievances with each other they bring it up at that time and then because everybody is really spiritually stabilized then okay you know at that time you did like this i felt very angry because of this oh you know but i did that because of this oh i didn't know that at all i thought you did it because of this like this and then things many times things get clarified and even if things are not resolved at least if the concern is communicated and is understood that itself actually resolves a significant amount of the issue that means that i say we all need to be understood and we need understanding as much as the human mind uh, as our, our we our heart needs understanding as much as our body needs oxygen when we don't get oxygen we feel suffocated so similarly when we don't get understanding we feel we feel agitated we feel we, we overreact so basically if you can create some occasions when we meet and first have a nice spiritual discussion so if you are working in a group with some people with whom we are going to have when we are going to do anything challenging together there are going to be times when there are going to be issues with it i want to do it this way you want to do it that way there's going to be difference 
So some people are like that, that you know, even if they are wrong, they still don't admit they are wrong. Mm. Yes, my opinion has changed, but what has not changed is the fact that I am right. <laughs> 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 so, it's very difficult to deal with people like that. But most people are not that blatant. So, if we have some proper forums where we bring out our concerns, not in a judgmental, accusatory way, but in a gentle way of expressing our concerns, then what will happen? We can, we can diffuse the explosion that may happen. And that way, we can maintain our relationships much more stably. Rather being strung by the tongue, we will be joined together by the tongue. Now our speech can bring us closer to each other and if we are serving Krishna together, it can bring us closer to Krishna also. I will conclude with one incident from Srila Prabhupada's life. We often think of Srila Prabhupada as a person who was very strong in condemning people, you know, fools, rascals. You may have heard the statement like that. Now Prabhupada spoke those. But Prabhupada spoke those on very specific occasions. He spoke those only to his very close disciples in morning walks. In his purports, in his lectures, he has hardly ever used those kind of words. Very, very rarely. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada has written something like, if you look at all his published books, there are something like 120,000 words that he has spoken. No, sorry, 120,000. It is an average book is 50,000. He has written about um, one. It is one lakh twenty one hundred twenty thousand words he has spoken, roughly. This is a rough estimate. Now, in that, in all his written words, he has used words like fools or rascals barely 25 times. But he has used the word Krishna almost three, almost 30. 300,000 times. Krishna was an equivalent of Krishna. So, it is not that Prabhupada was always speaking strongly. There are times when Prabhupada spoke very gently. And the devotees came for the first time to India. There was a devotee, there was a person who had just become a disciple of Prabhupada, but he was not a very serious disciple. And normally Prabhupada had his disciples shave their heads, via tilak, via dhoti kurta. But this person had taken initiation, but he was still having a long beard, long hippie kind of hair and then he would come and join Kirtans and dance. Now, at one time, at one time it is good, but that was the time when also people were having this idea that the Hare Krishnas are people who take drugs and he was a typical example of a person who we would think as we are seeing only must be taking drugs. So, he was repeatedly misrepresenting Prabhupada and Prabhupada wanted to tell him no, they don't dress like this. You know, if you are having lo long hair, you can, you can have long hair, but it's a little bit properly kept. If there's a wild long hair is there. So, but Prabhupada was so gentle and sensitive. One one day when uh, when it, it became a little too much, people were really misunderstanding Prabhupada because of that. So one day Prabhupada called him, and there was a there was an article in a Back to Godhead magazine about how. <coughs> Haridas Thakur had had was oh, a great saintly person, and there was this prostitute who had come to try to tempt him, but Haridas Thakur kept chanting Hare Krishna, and she had become a devotee because of that. So whole article was there. And Prabhupada told him, "Look at this article," and then he saw so there was this picture of this prostitute initially when she was wearing like an alluring dress, and then she had become like a saintly cultured woman. So he says, "What is the difference between the two?" So he said, she's a devotee now. He says, yes, but what is the difference? He says, oh, now you know, she had such, she had hair, now she has, uh, she, her hair is different now. He says, Prabhupada, yes, that is the point. He says, oh, Prabhupada, do you want me to shave my hair? He says, yes, that is the point. <laughs> <laughs> so although Prabhupada was the spiritual master, he did not hand out the right acts, you know, you have to do this, you have to edit. He gently communicated. So there are times when strong communication is also required. But then most occasions uh, in close relationship with gentle communication, that is what is required. So when we, rather than telling, why are you misrepresenting me like this? No, Prabhupada said, 
this is how a devotee is. Oh, I meant to be like this, I'll be like this. So what happened? In this way, Prabhupada also shows us how to communicate in a way that is non-violent, a way that is effective. And by such communication, just as Ranuman was able to bring down barriers, we can also bring down barriers. And our relationships can become very, can become much sweeter and much more fulfilling by having, uh, by learning to regulate and moderate our speech. We are not here to see through each other, you know, speaking harsh words and shooting each other down. We are here to see each other through. We are all having difficulties, we are all having unconditionings, we are all struggling and we are meant to help each other. We are all here to see each other through. And our speech can become a very powerful tool by which you can join hands and see each other through the life's see each other through in life's difficult journey, ultimately attaining Krishna. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on the topic of strung by the tongue. I started by talking about how uh, guns can be extremely dangerous, and if we had guns, we would be very very careful. But our speech can also be equally dangerous. Guns can break bodies, speech can break hearts. And sometimes you may unintentionally, circumstantially have a slip of a tongue and speak something terrible, which may grievously hurt the other person, like, like Sita did to Lakshman. Or sometimes you may plan in a cold-blooded way and try to counter-insult a person who we feel has insulted them. That like Duryodhan and Uluka to insult the Pandavas. So either way, by such words, we create big barriers between us and them. And we alienate people. So in contrast, if we learn to speak in a gentle way, we can bring down barriers like Hanuman did with Ram and Sita both. And for doing this, what, 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 what can we do? How can we regulate our speech? I said first one thing is learn when not to speak. Just because we know speaking doesn't mean that we know speaking. We have to learn also. Some place, strategic silence is the best way to deal with some situations. And even if you have some concerns, no need to speak them immediately. I talked about uh, one, three things I talked about. Strategic silence. Second is, when speaking, don't cut close to the nerve. Start from the objective and then come to the subjective. Start from the situation or the action and then speak our emotion and then maybe speak our perception. That, you know, you are lazy or responsible or whatever. If you just speak the action, we are starting with the 1% agreement, not the 99% disagreement. And then the chance of building uh, windows, not walls, increases. And lastly, I talked about how uh, if we can have a forum, if we are working closely with some people and there are potential, potential chances for uh, uh, tensions coming up, then we have a forum where we meet together specifically for discussing Krishna Katha. Not one person giving lecture, but everybody speaks some Krishna Katha by which we see each other spiritually as seekers and not just operationally as people who do this or do that or do that. And then after that, we in a non-judgmental, non-accusatory way speak out our concerns or grievances. In that spiritual atmosphere, where the spiritual setting has created a kind of shock absorber effect for us. We, if we communicate, then we can address those concerns very constructively. And then instead of our words taking us apart, they can bring us closer. And instead of being strung by the tongue, we'll be linked by the tongue, joined by the tongue. And instead of seeing through each other, we'll see each other through in life's troubled journey towards Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So any questions or comments? How can we channelize our anger? How can we channelize our anger? Yeah. I was just in Singapore, I spoke on burn your anger before anger burns you. So I said th three things are there. It's a, it's a elaborate subject, but first is acknowledge. Second is process. Third is act. So rather than seeing anger as bad or good. Some people may see anger, I should never become angry. Some people say anger as good. Now, I'll pu I've got the power to put this person in the place. Rather than seeing anger as good or bad, we see anger simply as a psychological reaction to a life event. 
just as there is if it's very cold our body may start trembling that's a physical reaction to a life event now some people may tremble much more some people may hardly tremble very little different bodies are different because similarly different minds are different so when we get angry rather than seeing our anger judgmentally as good or bad we see that simply objectively as this is a psychological reaction to a life event and anger indicates that we care mm. so anger when do we become angry about something or someone when we care about it so when we see this anger acknowledge yes i am feeling angry right now but i am here my anger is here rather than identifying with the anger we identify and acknowledge anger is present over here then after that process means we said anger indicates that we care so try to understand what it is that i care about say if we are told someone to clean our clean the room and a person not say we told our child to clean their room and they not cleaned it now what is it that i care about is it that the room is unclean and people who guests are coming and they will see how unclean the house is is it that you know that a child is undisciplined or is it that if my child doesn't listen to me that means i am an ineffective parent and i am insecure because of that so we when we process we try to go down deeper to what is it that i care about mm. and when we do that we will find that there is a possibility to agree on it that means yes now the children the child if i really care for this child i want a child to learn good habits then we can communicate that to them in a more effective last is act act doesn't mean that every time that we just forgive or neglect not does it mean it lash out but we can when we process it normally we think of our emotions in two terms either express or repress but process means we go down to what is it that i really care about over here and once we understand what i care about then we can act on that okay if we want a child to learn the ethics of cleanliness that's one thing if you want a child to learn the ethics of obedience that's another thing so what is it that i care about then we stress that and act accordingly then it's likely to be more effective so acknowledge if we deny the anger it will it will burst eventually acknowledge then process what is it that really care about and then act to address that which we care about otherwise what we care about is lost and only our anger or outrage at that particular action comes up and the person says this is a small thing why are you so upset about it so what happens the communication doesn't happen if we learn to process anger then it helps quite a bit to deal with it okay you said that uh, whenever somebody talks uh, bad about your spiritual masters or the vaishnavas then it's okay to be angry mm -hmm. i think okay how you explain this if somebody talks bad about our spiritual master vaishnavas then it's okay to be angry yes it's a principle that we shouldn't tolerate the blasphemy of the lord or his devotees at the same time we have to see how we can address the issue constructively the example is given of how destructively this principle may apply may be applied is in the dakshas in the daksha yagya you know first daksha criticized lord shiva and then he did and then she was followers curse daksha and then daksha's followers curse she was followers and eventually it became a disaster this violence and there was killing and it escalated beyond all proportions so now we could say when shiva was minimized when she was not given the um, proper place of, of sacrifice that he was due in that yagya it is it is the duty of his disciples to be angry and the, the, yes it is a insult to the spiritual master that that is true but ultimately every principle that we may hear is subordinate to the principle that we are meant to serve krishna we are meant to remember krishna we are meant to serve krishna so by getting angry and by venting out that anger am i really serving krishna am i really making the situation more favorable for the service of krishna or am i making it more unfavorable so basically the idea the underlying this point again that we should be angry when uh, uh, krishna or his devotees are blasphemed or spiritual master blasphemed the point is that we should not be emotionally uninvolved in connection with krishna the whole purpose of bhakti is that we need to be emotionally engaged with krishna 
So if somebody whom we love is criticized, naturally we feel bad about it. So the, the underlying principle is that if we, fee, if we don't feel anything when those whom we are supposed to love are criticized, then that means maybe we don't have any love for them. So the underlying principle is that we should have emotional involvement, we should have emotional connection. We should have emotions invested in Krishna and his devotees. Now specifically that anger, how we express it, that may have to be carefully decided in a way that is constructive. Not that that helps in addressing the situation, not uh, not worsens the situation. Okay. Thank you. You gave an example uh, about uh, barriers, like when Hanuman uh, met Ram for the first time, mm -hmm. uh, he spoke in a way such that the barriers are reduced because uh, Ram himself was vulnerable, and searching out for uh, yeah. Hanuman. Now, uh, the question is. Does Lord also go through all these emotions where he is vulnerable or he is just acting in a way so that it gives uh, lessons to the or instructions for a common man? Mm. Good question. Now, when does, Krishna, does the Lord also go through emotions or is he simply acting to give instructions? Well, different bhakti traditions have different understandings of this. The Gaudiya Vishnu understanding is that the Lord is Rasaraj. He has Rasa, he has emotions. And his emotions demonstrate him to be a living, loving person, not just an abstract principle. So God is a living, loving person. And his emotions enhance his personality. So when when, Hiran, when Hiranyakashipu is threatening Prahlad, and Narasimha gets, gets angry at that time. That, that anger shows his bhakta vatsalya. So he is simply acting to threaten or scare Hiranyakashipu. No, he is really angry at that time. And we see that anger, even after Hiranyakashipu is, is delivered. We have a hospital in Mumbai, in this operation theatre, they have put a picture of Hiranyakashipu being killed by Narasimha Dev. So once a patient came there, he said, what is that? <laughs> yes, that's an operation. That's the original operation. <laughs> oh, really? What was the result of the operation? This is operation successful, patient liberated. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> now, in fact, Nasimadeva was so angry that even after Hiranyakashipu was killed, still he remained angry. And when the devatas came to pacify, still the Lord was not pacified. So the acharyas explained that that actually why was the Lord, why was he not pacified? Because he was angry with the devatas that I love Prahlad and you know that I love Prahlad and yet when Prahlad was being tormented and threatened, you neither protected him nor you and you neither protested about it. So you did not do anything to protect or protest, and now you are offering all these prayers to me. I don't accept these prayers. But eventually, when Prahlad offered prayers, the Lord became peaceful. So, his emotions are also real. Now, there's a difference. This is a whole big subject. But the idea is that Krishna, when he, he goes through Leela, Leela at one level is like a drama. Hmm? Now, in the drama, now when we use the word drama, there's a sense of unreality to it. But it's not unreality, this is the supreme reality. This is where the Supreme Lord relishes loving emotions. So we could say that if you consider Krishna is the central actor in this drama, then uh, if it's from Rajalila, then Yoga Maya is like the director. So according to Yoga Maya's direction, maybe Mother Yashoda catches Krishna and tries to tie him. According to her direction, Krishna tries to run away. Yoga Maya. So Yoga Maya is like the director. So the actors act according to the director's direction. And for the actor to actually enjoy, relish the role, the actor has to enter into that role. And to the extent the actor enters into that role, to the extent the onlookers also enter into that role. Enter, and then, so Krishna, when he is performing his Leela, he enters into that role. And he experiences those emotions. Rudantam muhur netram yugmam rujantam. Karambhoja Yugamena Satanka Netram. So Satanka Netram is crying and his eyes were with Atanka. Atanka means terror. 
what is my mother going to do to me now? His real, real fear was there at that time. But that doesn't mean that he is, he is no longer God, that he is fearful. How it is, there is a director who, who directs the play and the, play, the players, the actors enter into the role. But the director also directs according to a script. Hmm? The script writer determines what role who is going to do. So we could say that in Krishna Lila, Krishna is the di Krishna is the actor, Yogamaya is the director, but Krishna is the script writer. <laughs> so that means that Krishna is controlled by Yogamaya according to a script that he himself has written. So in that sense, Krishna, this is Achintya Bhedaved in Lila. Krishna is not in control because Krishna is running, Krishna is fearful, Krishna is upset, Krishna is angry. So he is not in control. But still, those emotions are also according to his script, according to his plan. So he is in control. So in that sense, when Krishna goes through various emotions, there is a real emotion that he is going through, but that doesn't mean that he has forgotten his real position as God. Okay? Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah? I have a basically a problem. Uh, suppose uh, I am uh, very much deep into an uh, emotion, maybe of uh, worry or maybe anger. And uh, after a while, I realize that uh, I'm too much disturbed by it. And it's a very big momentum of that emotion that has built up. So sometimes I feel that if I try to apply emergency brakes, I will feel even more disturbed, maybe in a different direction. Maybe I will have a, this kind of guilt why I was like this. So I have a problem, uh, it's not a question, I have a problem that how to apply that kind of emergency brakes at, at that very moment and come out of it. Mm. Yeah, it's a challenge. You know, when we have certain strong emotions, anger, how do we apply emergency brake? Well, the emergency brake is a very strong word. I prefer to use the word, the pause button. It's a little gentler. <laughs> so, not stop, not play, but pause. Pause for some time. So, we can find out ourselves what kind of pause button works for us. Because some people just deep breathing. <sighs> our breathing is very strongly connected with our emotions. So, when we are angry, we breathe faster. We consciously breathe slowly, we will find that we will feel calmer. Mm. We may they find out that if we hear some music, maybe some Hare Krishna Kirtan, some soothing, gentle music, that may calm us down. Chanting some mantras ourselves may calm us down. Or different people may have different ways of dealing with the anger. And there's no one way that is right. We have to see what works for us. Some people, you know, they have a boxing bag and they punch the boxing bag. And that's how they try to work out the anger. Some people just go for a jog and they say, clears my head. So we have to find out based on our nature how we can clear our head at that time. And once we clear our head, that is now we may say the emergency if we are right now in an interaction with someone, at that time what we, I can't start punching a boxing bag. No, I can't do that. Yeah, that's true. But that time we might just use something like deep breathing. You say, okay, right now I can't talk. Let's let's defer this. Say, so, no, no, I won't talk right now. No, no. If I talk, things will become worse, right? Let's stop it. So we might just defer it. So, we have to find out a, a pause button that works for us. So, if you just look at, in general, the pause button should be related with something which we like to do, which we feel enlivened while doing. If, if that, uh, that itself is difficult to do, then what happens? We will not be able to direct our thoughts. Hey, this too, I don't want to do this. It's something which we like to do anyway. Then, our anger is, at that time, reason doesn't work. So, when emotion is strong, Reason doesn't work. So, if we try to reason with our emotion, it's going to be very difficult. But at that time, we need some way to either check the emotion or channel the emotion somewhere else. So, if, as I said, if some soothing music we hear, or say, if we have a sense of devotion towards Krishna, and then we have some picture, some darshan of Krishna, which is very attractive for us, just look at that and pray to that. Mm. Or whatever thing which can, which you like to do, which you can channel our emotion. If we do that, that can become like our pause button. Okay. Yes, uh, bro. I have a question. Uh, 
so you explained uh, wonderfully uh, how to be careful with the words uh, and uh, how to be mindful uh, not to uh, use any hurtful words. How to immunize ourselves from, from others who are using hurtful words on us. Yes. <laughs> Um, how to the past, uh, yeah. the past people have spoken. Uh, how to immunize ourselves from others' hurtful words? <coughs> it's a challenge. In bhakti, we are meant to develop a soft heart. But we have to cover the soft heart with a thick skin. <laughs> 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 if we develop a really soft heart and no thick skin, <laughs> that heart will be cut in hundred places. But if you develop only a thick skin and no soft heart, <laughs> then we will cut others' hearts. <laughs> and we will not connect with Krishna. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. But in general, we need to recognize that the nature of the world is that people are going to speak negatively about us. People are going to speak negatively about us. And especially, it is that the more fame we get, in this world nothing comes, everything is duality. So, if we get, the more honor we get, the more dishonor also we are likely to get. <coughs> it's just a part of the package of the material world. So, one thing is that we just learn that don't take it so, don't take it so personally. Now, you may say this, he's actually, this person criticizing me, how can I not take it personally? Yeah, that's true, but it's not just that person criticizing us, although it may appear like that. It is just that the nature of the world is that if I get honor, I'll get dishonor. Maybe it is coming through this person, but that's what it is. And another thing we could do is we also recognize that when we, when people speak harshly to, uh, to us, more often than not, it is not about us. It is not about us. It's like people are going through their own issues. Everybody has a movie going on in their head. And in their movie, they are the hero. And we are all extras. <laughs> we are all extras. And it's like sometimes in the past, the kings or landlords would have whipping boys. Whipping boys means when they get angry, this boy would be paid to be beaten by that person. Whip the person, whip the person, whip the person. And they went out their anger at that time. So sometimes it happens that generally with respect to lust or greed or other anarthas, if we if we feel greedy, okay, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. So the the stimulus, the trigger for that greed and the target of the greed are usually the same. No, I want this person has got this phone, I want that phone. No, this person, everybody is so proud of their phone, you know, so, so attractive, I want it. So the trigger and the target are usually the same. But with respect to anger, the two are often very different. Now, so person A makes me angry, person A be, makes B angry, and then B went the anger on C. So the trigger of anger and the target of anger are often very different. So that's why when somebody speaks harsh words to us, it may well be that it's not about us. Although they are targeted at us, but they are not about us. They are going through certain situations in their lives. And you speak something terrible at that time. So that way, we don't take it so personally. Another thing which we could see is that uh, if we look at our own lives, are there times when we got undeserved praise? Yes, we definitely get it. I got it through Radha Mudapro's introduction. <laughs> 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 so, if I got undeserved praise at times, I'll also get undeserved criticism at times. So, you could see that it's just a balancing out. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, ultimately, we can see that it is meant to take us closer to Krishna. That actually, whatever distresses happen in this world, it's like Prabhupada used the example that Krishna, that Ultimately, the material world, material energy, Maya is saying, go back to Krishna, go back to Krishna, go back to Krishna. So, we are all emotionally invested in various relationships. And this natural, as, as, as human beings, we have various relationships. But we want to be primarily emotionally invested in Krishna. So, sometimes if we get some hurtful words in a particular relationship, we may see that as an indication 
जो मे बी आई नीड टू इन्वेस्ट मोर ऑफ माई इमोशन इन कृष्णा एंड नॉट सो मच इन दैट रिलेशनशिप इट्स एड अवर बीच में पिता माँ दैट जस्ट बिफोर हिज डेथ he is he the man who had spoken on 100 subjects and fought 100 wars he withdrew his consciousness and focused it entirely on krishna so when the duryodhan spoke very harsh words to to vidur <coughs> he said this son of the son of a maid now he is like a traitor among us now indian culture in general is very hierarchical and we generally don't speak harshly about our elders at least not in their presence so vidura was in the same generation as dhritarashtra and he had openly spoke such terrible words to to vidura and at that time vidura felt hurt but vidura also saw duryodhan may have spoken this out of his anger and arrogance but he saw this so is not just duryodhan speaking out of mahamaya but this is also krishna arranging through yoga maya because he has spoken like this that means i have no re- he doesn't want me to be on his side so i have no reason to be on his side and he left he said he didn't have to fight on the side of the kauravas so he saw that as a action, as a impetus those harsh words hurt him but he saw beyond the hurt to the purpose of the lord this was a opportunity for me to disinvest myself from this entanglement with the kurus and focus on spiritual growth okay okay it's okay how much time do we have this one yeah okay the last question then so ji just before this question you asked about the pause button but often times in fact i have seen people putting me always and so i was very instantaneous whenever in fact there is an instance or any incident the provoking response is very instantaneous now please enlighten me how do we you know, put that pause because it's because of the past conditioning or whatever i should say in fact it's very very difficult to find yeah. that pause and i tend to act reactively and that has in fact damaged many many relationships in my life Yes, it's true that sometimes we have a lot of conditionings from the past, and they make it very difficult for us to restrain ourselves. Mm, yes, that's true. I, as I said, in Singapore we did an exercise. So I asked the audience, "How many of you feel that your anger is so strong that you can't control it?" So many devotees raised hands. Yes, and then I said, "Okay, if tomorrow your boss goes, you go to your office, and your boss suddenly gives a lot of work to you." How many of you feel angry? He says, "Yes, I feel angry." How many of you will yell at your boss? He says, "No one, no one." What does it mean? Although I feel angry, I have the capacity to not express my anger, and I may come back and express that anger at my spouse at home. <laughs> generally do. <laughs> generally do. Okay, but at least for that time, we have the capacity, so we can't say. that i don't have the capacity to control anger it may be matter of degree that okay i can't control it fully but i can control it a little bit at least i won't yell at my boss yes so so, so we do have the capacity to control that that we shouldn't it's our mind only saying that you no know, you can't control this and it's like two examples to illustrate this suppose we are playing a boxing match and suddenly the opponent bang gives a terrible punch He fall. He is knocked down on the ground. And now, now we need to get up and fight again. Now, if at that time <coughs> we ask the op- opponent itself, says, "Can I win this match?" Never. Quit right now. Now, this boxer wants to fight. The boxer cannot consult the opponent. The boxer has to to look towards the coach. Says, yes, you can do it. Yes, come on, fight. Do like this. Do like this. Do like this. So similarly for us, it is the mind that knocks us down, and then the mind only says, "It says you cannot control anger." So it is the first. The mind only knocked us down. The fight. The first burst of anger that came. It came because of the mind only. But now, if we consult the mind, then how are we going to ever save ourselves? So we need to. We need. We can't listen to that mind at that time. even if we feel that, oh, i can't control my anger and it may be true to some extent but we can control to some extent it's not that we can't control at all 
and that some level of control can be gradually increased. Mm. And that's why I said this. It's rather than seeing this as zero or one digital logic, we see the analog analog, analog logic. Okay, I'll get angry, but let me try to become aware of when I get angry. And I can do course correction quicker before I cause too much damage. So that way if we see it, see it as a progression, we may have a little scope. One of my friends was a boxer, very, very well built and he had a fracture. So his hand was in a cast and when the hand was, the cast was removed, so he said, the doctor told him now, his therapist said now you have to start exercising your arm. He says, Exos for the um, exercise when you know, going to the gym and pumping iron, lifting big weights. He says, you know, I can't even lift my hand. What exercise can I do? He said, can you lift your little finger? He said, yeah. He said, that is your exercise. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, just lift your finger. Five times in the morning, five times in the afternoon, five times in the evening. <laughs> hey, this is all exercise. No, for you, this is the exercise. And you just did it for two, three days, and you said, now you lift your all five fingers. And then, after he started lifting the palm. And then eventually, he got his full mobility of the hand back. But at that time, if he had said, I will not start with the finger, not have been able to do anything. So it's like, uh, when we try to improve ourselves, sometimes we feel small steps are insignificant. What is the hard difference is going to make? But small steps also <coughs> count in the long run. The process of self-improvement is evolutionary. It's evolution, gradual increment. But the result of this process, the product of this process is revolutionary. So sometimes we can't see the link from the evolution to the revolution. This evolution is so small, what is the difference it's going to make? But every small step is a step forward. And that evolution will lead to the dramatic transformation in the long run. Okay. So thank you very much. Krishna Prabhupada ki. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki. Itai Gaur Premanande. Hari Hari Gaur. Krishna Chaitanya Janam Prabhu ki. Jai. Prabhupada ki. Jai.